You're listening to episode 139 of the Master Your Mind, Business, and Life podcast. Today's guest is nothing short of amazing. Alan Cohen spent decades as both a marketing expert and human resources consultant. He presided over the successful launch of the Harry Potter series as Scholastic's Director of Marketing, as well as Director of Communications for the Broadway League. Alan then shifted into becoming more purpose-driven. He became a coach and has since helped and inspired senior-level executives and teams to become more connected to their lives and business goals, resulting in greater performance and highly improved business results. Did you all catch those two little words I dropped in there? Harry Potter? (laughs) Yeah, we're going there. It's funny because I always tell my guests to aim around 30 minutes for our conversations. I want to be mindful and respectful of their time. And Alan originally had an engagement lined up after our call. But right before I hit record, he told me that he had pushed back that engagement so we could have more time. And thank goodness that he did because I just can't imagine this conversation flowing any other way than it did. Before I share this week's episode, let's do a little review of the week. This one comes from IV underscore Allie H and it reads, love the topics that Lauren explores on this podcast. Her guests are so inspirational and always leave me with great ideas to apply to my life. IV Allie H, thank you so much for taking the time to leave a review. Life mastery on all levels is really the goal of the podcast. I always say if you even have one takeaway from each episode, that's a huge win in my book. Knowledge is power and I love learning and expanding my mind and it fills my heart knowing that so many others not only enjoy learning too, but that you choose to nerd out with me and my guests weekly. If you'd like a chance to have your review featured, drop a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you tune in and turn it up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button too, that way you don't miss an episode. All right, are you ready to meet this week's guest? You know what to do. Tune in, turn it up, let's go. You're listening to Master Your Mind, Business and Life. Conversations with everyday world shifters, truth seekers, and rule breakers. Here's your host, Lauren Smith. Hey everyone, it's Lauren Smith. Welcome back to another episode. Today's guest is Alan Cohen. Alan is an executive coach, team consultant, and emotional intelligence expert. Hey Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. We were having a great conversation before we even hit record, so I'm really excited to dive in. But you have quite the interesting background, which involves this little old book series that I don't think anyone (laughs) has ever heard about, (laughs) Harry (laughs) Potter. I mean, come on, Harry Potter. I would just love to hear the journey that got you into public relations and then eventually into coaching. Sure, sure. Well, and and my experience with Harry Potter was kind of a seminal moment for me for for a whole bunch of different reasons, but and and I'll get to that in a moment. So, so I um so when I got out of college about a million years ago, I uh, well not a million years ago, but you know, (laughs) I uh, I I was an English English and theater major, and I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps which was to be in public relations. So I worked in, in publicity and public relations for probably about 20 years, 20, yeah, about 20 years, working for agencies, um, doing a lot of entertainment, PR, and cultural sponsorships. Mm-hmm. And then I also worked on the client side doing crisis communications. And, uh, but I did have a, uh, a, 10-year, a 10-year run working at Scholastic Publishing, which is a children's media company, which I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with. Your kids Mm -hmm. are maybe reading Scholastic (laughs) Books right now. And and I was the head of publicity for Scholastic Books and was handed a a, a then virtually unknown book property called, drumroll please, (laughs) Harry Potter, and uh, was told by my boss in no uncertain terms that my team was responsible for making the book a a big bestseller in the United States, and and well, you know how that all turned yeah. out. Uh, <laughs> the the rest is is publishing history. But but what's interesting about that experience is uh, well, a couple of things. And and uh, first first, and it is actually the topic of my TEDx uh, talk, which is called the magical power of shared purpose. And <clears throat> so what I learned from that experience was that even a very small team 
which in, in this instance was really a seven person publicity team, which I ran, um, can do amazing things um, when they are aligned around a shared purpose. In this case, it was really to get young boys to read great books of fiction <clears throat> and, and kind of against the odds because the team was pretty dysfunctional and we had very limited resources and, and all of that, but we were committed and, and, did, um, and we sort of see through time when, when mm -hmm. companies or teams or orga um, organizations, so, uh, communities come together, uh, they can overcome a, a whole bunch of obstacles. So, so that was, um, but what was really significant for me about that experience was more, um, less about sort of building a blockbuster and having that publicity coup uh, on my resume, but it was really about leading a team and empowering others to, to step into their strengths and to get out of their way. And uh, mm. there were some people on my team who, who were just so outstanding. And, and so ultimately, I, you know, I gave them the, I, I let them shine and then I did step in away at one point into human resources training and development uh, and then pivoted into coaching uh, coaching certification and and, uh, and and so now for I guess the past 12 years I've been coaching executives small business owners uh, teams um, to help them be more effective to help them connect to uh, what's most meaningful in terms of purpose. And, uh, and I do a lot of work with emotional intelligence, which I think is how we maybe were introduced in the first place, um, you know, helping, helping leaders be more emotionally intelligent in order to be more successful. Well, there, there's a lot I want to pick apart. Yeah, there's a lot I want to pick apart in this. I'm like, oh we gosh, do. where can we go? But I, let's start, because I know everyone <laughs> listening is first like, okay, we have to get past the Harry Potter part so I can get into the emotional intelligence part. We just have to. So within the show a lot, we talk about just how powerful childhood itself mm. is and how those experiences shape and shift us. I'm sure that you had to really tap into or awaken your inner child while working on Harry Potter. Now, I have to tell you that I have done a ton of interviews over the years. You are the first person to ask that question. And Stop. that is the one of the best questions any host has ever asked. Really? Oh, and dang. I, and, I, and I told you today, I'm, I'm a little weepy anyway, because of all that's going on mm. in, in the world. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so I... Uh, I warn you, tears, tears may be coming. Um, but uh, you know, I, uh, I when I got into children's publishing, I had no experience in children's publishing. Mm. Uh, it, it was kind of a stretch for me. I, I, I had been a child, so I had read children's books, uh, but I didn't have children of my own. And 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 people working in children's books, you know, they're pretty quirky. And uh, while I'm quirky, I'm not necessarily quirky in a children's book way. Um, kind of, you know, if there weren't a lot of men, you know, sort of working in children's books back then, if you were a, if you were a man in uh, working in publicity, you, know, you were probably working at ESPN or, or some Fortune 50 kind of, kind of <laughs> right. company, not working, you know, like promoting um, books that squeak and books that um, pop up. Yeah. Um, so, but, um, but I, I kind of faked it a little bit, you know, mm. and, and a lot of times my imposter syndrome would kick in because people would be talking all about their kids and, you know, and the books that their kids were reading and why we were publishing what we were publishing. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, <laughs> how many books am I, how many books do I have to market this right. year? Really uh, in, the, in but, the hustle. Exactly. You know, 500 books a year and, you know, they were all important. But, but when I read, I remember being handed the, the, the typed pages the um, of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It hadn't been published in the U.S. yet. It had been a hit in the U.K., but it had to be Americanized. And and I remember not being able to put the book down. I remember um, staying up all night to read it. And mm. I remember calling the editorial director. His name is Arthur Levine. If he's listening, hello, Arthur. Um, <laughs> and leaving a voicemail for him at probably three or four in the morning saying, Arthur, this is, this is one of the best books that I've ever read, not only just as a child, as a children's book, but this is a book. And, and what I, what I remember now and in, in, in thinking back is that it really connected me to the, the, the greatest books of my childhood books, like books like the Phantom Tollbooth, 
than James and the Giant Peach and, mm. um, and also series books um, like the Hardy Boys books, those adventures and, and um, you know, Char Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Uh, you know, those were books, those were seminal books for me as a child. And, um, and I've forgotten about that. So it awakened in me, the Harry Potter books awakened in me um mm -hmm. that memory and also i think what i where i really related to harry um potter in particular is you know as a kid um you know i so so i'm a, an out i'm a gay a gay man and um you know but but i always i knew that i was different as a kid mm -hmm. and um and you know it was a different time back then and couldn't really talk about um talk about that right. um and you know not at not at Maybe not, maybe around 10 or 11 or 12, you know, I started getting an inkling that I was, you know, there was something different about me. Um, you know, I related to Harry as like the outsider. Mm. And, um, and I, uh, so I really did connect to that. And, and also J.K. Rowling created a universe um, that really just allowed me to um, uh, expand my imagination. And, yeah. Uh, so that was a long-winded answer, but um, but those books are were really were magical for me, and uh, um, I, I couldn't. I don't think that we could have been as successful in promoting that book had we had the books not been so fantastic yeah just uh, that's an amazing word fantastic yeah. that that's it and thank you yeah. for being vulnerable about how that took you back and and how you were able to connect with your childhood and, and you know it was funny that you were able to connect with your childhood in that way but as i was reading your bio you actually connected me to my childhood because i can remember very vividly i was in sixth grade when this this came out and my favorite part was the scholastic book fairs i remember oh, yeah. how they would all be set up those big carts yeah. come rolling in and i remember all of my yeah. friends moms would volunteer and you know you got to take the flyer home and circle which one do you want like i that was a very exciting part to me yeah. as a child and i vividly remember sitting with my neighbor Alyssa and we were going through it and we saw Harry Potter and we didn't know what Harry Potter was but how cool did the Sorcerer's Stone sound you know like you just see uh -huh. this this wizard and you're like I need this book like I and I remember getting that book and actually that was beyond the allowance that I had for the book fair uh -huh. And my dad had what was called the bank of dad, where if I got money for my birthday or, you know, Christmas, whatever, I gave it, put it to, gave it to my dad. He put it in, in the bank of dad and I would have to make withdrawals of my money, you know, keep, keep me a little um, responsible for my finances, even as a child. <laughs> so I remember going to the bank of dad, even <laughs> being like, I need a couple more dollars, <laughs> out of, uh, you know, my allowance to get this. And I remember reading that and discussing it with my neighbor. And then fast forward to my senior year of high school, even. And then my friends and I are all working together at, um, we had a, we all had summer jobs together at a campground, at a Yogi Bear campground. And we had to dress up as Yogi Bear. Um, and we would bring our copies of like Deathly Hallows with us and like discuss it. it then. So like I, I love when it. I was just reading your bio, you were taken back to your childhood working on the sure. project, but even just knowing what you did and what your position was, I was taken back to my childhood through you. Very so cool. thank you for, cool. for playing a part in that because while it may not seem big on, on your level, it's definitely big even on mine. Well, well, then thank you for sharing that. That, that was that was lovely. I, I um I think as Harry Potter, there's a moment you know this as a parent probably you know there is a moment or there'll be a moment where you you know sort of give your child out off to the world, right? And there's like you know they they grow up they grow, um <laughs> you did your job and then yeah. you and, and and um you know and I think because it's been over twenty years since you know since those books were launched that you know it. it I need to be reminded sometimes of the impact and you know that we had and you know in a, in a little way at the beginning and it's nice it's I would I would say that there there are very few days where I don't come into contact with somebody whose life was in some way impacted by by Harry Potter and um you know and that that's that feels really good. Yeah, well and we also like to talk about like you know sometimes just in our personal lives making that shift into something new 
is very scary and it, it can be very fearful. How did you know when it was time to step away and to kind of lean into or shift into something different? Oh, uh, great. So, well, so I, I, I so there have been a, as, as any entrepreneur, entrepreneur knows, it's not always a, uh, not always a linear path. So I left PR to go into human resources and training and, and began to dabble a little bit in coaching, but then uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, I went back into public relations. Um, it was kind of, it was easier in a way because <laughs> I had done it for so long and I was, I was going for the cash. It was just easier, right. um, but it wasn't easy. It was actually profoundly difficult. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I had taken a, a job as head of communications for the Broadway League, which, uh, which is the trade association for mm -hmm. Broadway. And, um, you know, which is, you know, Broadway is my first love and it's just, it, I, I'm a former actor in another life. And it just, it, it's my, it's heartbreaking right now that Broadway is closed down and mm -hmm. will be for the foreseeable future. But I, um, but so that was however many years ago, 15 years ago or something like that. I was working there as head of communications and, yeah. and we were involved in some sort of labor negotiation. And it was a, pardon my Pardon my English. It was just such a shit show. Mm. I, you know, the, it was an ugly, ugly negotiation. And I, I just, you know, I had tolerated PR for a long time, just, just, just cause. Um, but in my heart of hearts, like I just, in my soul, I knew that it wasn't, it wasn't the full expression of who I am and what, yeah. and what I can bring to the world. And, and so I actually just, I went, I'd gone through coach certification and you know, and I, I was making a lot. I, it, I had a plan that I was going to wait for this perfect time to leave and set up my shingle and, and, and start a coaching business, coaching people in, in public relations and other industries I knew and uh, around leadership and communications and, and all. And uh, but there was just kind of this day I was just like, enough is enough. I just can't do this anymore. And actually, the time my timing was terrible. In high, I, I, it was terrible and it was perfect. I, I actually quit my job um, right around the Tony Awards, which was like, you know, my boss could have killed me. Right. And, um, but I gave her, you know, I gave her notice. But then when I left, the, the economy, like the bottom of the economy mm. fell out because um, that was, I guess, what, 12 years ago? Um, and so now I had, you know, it's like, oops, I'm in business now. Where am I, you know, how am I going to get clients? What am I going to do? Right. And, um, and, but, opportunity smiled at me. You know, I was kind of, I was, I was ready. And uh, so initially I just started coaching uh, a lot of wall street professionals who, uh, who, <laughs> who had lost their jobs and were trying to figure out what their next play would be. And so I did a lot of career coaching initially and that worked out pretty well, but you know, the, the, the right time is, is when you decide it is, I, you know, there's never, there's no perfect time. Um, you know, I see that a lot with clients um, or prospects that they're getting ready to get ready to get ready. They're waiting for all the everything to line up, and and uh, there's never going to be a perfect time. Um, it, it, a perfect time is when you is when you make the decision. Oh, I love that, and that's so true because otherwise we can wait for that moment for the rest of our lives and just keep waiting. And what does that bring us? Yeah, and I also think, and I was just talking about this earlier today, and it's like. When, like right now is an interesting moment in time, you know, for, for purpose-driven leaders that like, it's very easy to lose focus and lose sight on what your purpose is. Ooh, yeah. um, and uh, because there's so much going on right now in the world, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to get stressed out. It's easy to chase the thing that seems that, that's right in front of you. But we need to remember what we're here for and what we're here to do. The, the expression of it may change given the circumstances, mm -hmm. but, but it, it's, we need to just keep our eye on the prize yeah. and, um, because the world, the world needs leaders to lead and, and people to live on, on purpose and to express our purpose. And, and so that I, I think you know, when your purpose is burning, you know, I think the best time, the better time to choose is when your purpose is, is burning so bright um, that, that uh, the only thing that, that there's nothing that can put it out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, less desirable. Well, I don't know, maybe if you're in great, great pain, um, you know, sometimes that's also the time to leave. 
Right. Um, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I think people get to that point in all, all types of ways. And sometimes it's that dark night of that, of the soul moment where you're just finding yourself on the bathroom floor. Like, what am I supposed to do next? You know, or like, show me a way. But you know, another thing that we really have to deal with in this day and age is we are life in itself is so full of distractions, especially those virtual distractions like social media and they can make us feel connected in a sense, but it really lacks that human to human, personal, real, raw yeah. connection. And yeah. now that we've had this pandemic and the stay at home orders, and right now at the time that we are speaking, um, it's what's known as Blackout Tuesday in support of the Black community and really make sure that we're, we're raising more awareness. And I feel like right now, and it's we're just craving more connection and even more unity, probably more than ever in a time that I can remember. What are some tips that you have that can help us be better at connecting with others or even create a relationship of connection when we feel it slipping? Yeah. So what a, what a great question. And, uh, and, you know, a few years ago, I wrote a book called the connection challenge, um, which, which addressed this, but, you know, really the book that's, that's kind of like the perfect book for right now, for, for, for this moment, the connection mm-hmm. challenge, how to, you know, how, how we can overcome distractions and stay connected to the things that matter most. And, and I think that, you know, boy, this is a, it's a tough time, right? I mean, you know, there are a lot of people working from home. We've got the distractions now of their kids or their spouse or their, the, or their you know, dog. Their, their, <laughs> we were talking about that or the, the your chief cook and bottle washer um your you know the mm-hmm. dishes are in the thing i feel like god why is my apartment always so dirty <laughs> yeah. um but I, but i think that i mean this and this is kind of my 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 mindfulness moment but it, i i do believe that connection it's an inside job it has to start with yourself mm. um you know while there are a lot of people in our lives uh, selves included who are craving connection, you know, we're, we're wired for connection, but you know, now we're told that we have to physically distance. So, you know, that, that's, that's hard, right? So we have to right. double down on connection um, and figure out creative ways. But I think that, I do think that taking the pause moments of mindfulness mm-hmm. moments of just, just, just feeling where your feet are on the ground, smelling the air, feeling, feeling, you know, just getting in touch with, with all of your different senses. I think that we've got to just spend some time throughout the day doing that, even if it's just moments, less television, less cable, less news, less input. Um, I actually do a thing called graphic journaling, um, which is my mindfulness practice. So I, I just, uh, um, kind of, kind of visual vocabulary, uh, mm. just sort of free writing and drawing and it helps me get more connected to myself, my, you know, my mind, my spirit. Um, that's where it's got to start. But then, but then I also feel like, you know, we all have like Zoomitis, right? I'm sure other guests have, have <laughs> talked about Zoomitis. Um, I actually want to start a line of men's underwear called Fruit of the Zoom. <laughs> I haven't trademarked that yet. <laughs> but, uh, get on but, it. <laughs> get on it. Get on it. Um, we need to change it up. So um, it's, it's it can actually be too much stimulation, too many visual inputs. Mm. So so pick, you know it doesn't always have to be a Zoom call or a FaceTime call. It can be a phone call. It can right. be a text. Right. Um, it can be snail mail. Oh my God, get sending somebody like a, a handwritten postcard right now or a letter, um, you know, praying Huge. that the post office stays, you know, stays open. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, there are lots of different ways to connect. And, and uh, you know, I think that there, and it's okay to slow down and, um, and really lean into some of these conversations and, and, and create some of that intimacy too. So mm-hmm. I, um, I was telling you earlier, you know, it's, I, I attend a, a, a business networking group. You know, it's all about connecting and networking and referrals and and, and right. you know your forty-five second commercial. But today was so lovely. It was online and and actually they kind of um, 
invited everybody to stay afterwards and just talk about what was going on right now. And just like, it was the most non-business mis- business meeting I've ever attended. And, um, and people just, you know, people cried, people shared, people reached out, you know, lent support to each other. And that's, that's what these t- times need. I, you know, I'm an oh, expert yeah. in emotional intelligence and I always come back to this, that, you know, it's uh, emotional times require emotionally intelligent solutions. Mm. And, and some of that is just really just stepping into empathy, just listening, just creating more space for people to feel, feel safe and seen and heard and, and, and connect. And, mm. and uh, so I, you know, hopefully there's something in there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. Well, I, I think it. holding the space in itself is something that we can all be better at and do better at of just holding the space and um, something that I had even learned. And uh, this was actually from a, a prior podcast guest. And he was like, did you, did you actually know that if you are a woman and you're venting, you should vent to another woman, not to your spouse? Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why? <laughs> and he said, well, because your, your spouse, your partner, if it's a man, he's, he's going to want to fix it, right? Like men want to yeah. fix and women's are just like, oh my goodness, like that, that's terrible. And I was like, wow, I never, I didn't think about it in that arena. And he was like, well, actually he's like, I've shifted myself to be more in the feminine energy and learn how to hold the space more and not want to fix and do. So how can like, we really just, I mean, you're talking about emotional intelligence, but this could be a whole new topic to people. But (laughs) so how can we, first off, like begin to hold more space and lean into empathy, but also maybe touch more on emotional intelligence and and what that is. Sure. So So, you know, I think, I think that it's important to also distinguish the difference between sympathy and empathy. And Mm. and I think that, you know, a lot of times when we're sympathizing, we're in so much pain, you know, we're so uncomfortable with what the other person is experiencing that we, that we want to like fix it. it, 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 Often it's less about their pain and suffering, but it's more about how painful it is for us to, you know, so, so there is some with empathy, there is a little bit of detached involvement, Mm -hmm. um, where it's like, you still can imagine, um, JK Rowling has a great quote actually about empathy and um, and imagination, but you know, it forces, it it, it compels us to sort of imagine what that other person might be experiencing given, given their life view and and perspective. But it, but, but it's also trusting that that individual, as we say in coach land, um, that people are creative, resourceful and whole. And that, that the answers are within them. Mm-hmm. And as a good listener, it's actually to make them feel safe to kind of untangle the, the, the confusion and, and the, the mess that's, that's in the way of their accessing their own wisdom mm-hmm. and their own intuition and their own, um, their own North Star. And it's very, while well, it's understandable that you want to take, you want to, preclude somebody's pain and suffering that it, because it makes us uncomfortable. I mean, nobody wants to, that sometimes people need to struggle in order to come to the realization that only they can come to rather than be told what to do or, um, you know, to be directed. It, it, it's, it's well, the metaphor is like, you know, if, if you, if you hear a, a, a butterfly, you know, in the cocoon, you know, the, um, the, uh, the wings are flapping and you cut that cocoon, mm. the, the, the butterfly will die, right? Part of the, the butterfly's evolution and coming, coming to the world is through the struggle. They're, they're actually strengthening their, it's strengthening its wings. I, that's a butterfly or it's a moth. I, either way, it, <laughs> either way, either way it, it, it applies. So um, your scientist um, your <laughs> listeners can <laughs> send, me, send me a nasty email or a correction. Um, but, you know, but that's the th- like we have to sometimes let people struggle to mm-hmm. in order to to empower them to find the answers for themselves that are in in there. Um, I mean, sometimes if we have a piece of information or, or you know that'll be valuable, then we want to share it. But um, but it's very difficult, right? You know, so I'm I'm. You know, I'll give you a great example. So I, I am. Uh, I am, uh, I'm married to a, a chairman of an emergency room here mm. in, in New York, you know, who's right in the heart of the thick of things. And, you know, and when my dad was, when my dad um, was diagnosed with cancer 
Um, and my father is fine. Thank God, bless him. Um, it's a blessing. He's 91 years old. He survived oh, cancer. Wow. But when I, when I, you know, was telling, you know, sharing with Barry, you know, my, my fears, my anxiety, my concern, you know, he went right into like doctor talk. Mm. He was like, you know, this is like the epidemiology and this is like, and I'll probably have X amount of years and this is what we need to do. And, da, 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 da. and, and I was like, whoa, like, like time out. Like, I want you to like, listen to me, the, you know, as, as, um, as a son. Yeah. As a son whose father has just been diagnosed with cancer, as somebody, you know, you know, who is, you know, I don't need to be told like the epidemiology and like, you know, what the treatment protocols are going to, I can look that yeah, up. Right. Like, I, I just need to, I just need to be able to express my sadness yeah. and my fear. And, um, and so I don't think it's just, me, it's not just, you know, men, yeah. it's men, men and women. I think, you know, we, we often, you know, and it's not bad, bad intention. Mm. It's just a, it's just a lack of training yeah. in in listening and actively listening and listening between the lines for what somebody is saying and and building our empathy muscle and, and not going to fix it and uh, and all of that. So. What is is there like a good go to phrase like when someone comes to you like to build that empathy muscle if someone is coming to you and they and they need you to just listen like are is it good to just say I'm here for you or because I think a lot of people they're like okay what do I do what do I say I don't want to say the wrong thing this is oh my goodness not saying the wrong thing is coming up so much right now especially yeah. with, the, yeah. with the riots and protests so sure and then yeah, of yeah, course yeah. and then like you can be called out for not saying anything at all because of silence but. It's a fine line, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, I, you know, it would it would depend on the situation and the relationship. Right. You know, I might say, you know, you know, I have a million, you know, a million thoughts and a million things I want to share with you right now, but I also just want to, I, I just want to be here for you. To, I just want to be here to listen, mm. right? You know, so it, it's like, you know, I, also one of the most what one of the four the four most powerful words that you can say to a person right now is, "What do you need?" Uh, what do you need or what do you need right now? And and not right. asking them, what do you need? But, and, and that's very different than like, um, you know, what can I do for you? Like, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Nothing. Because nothing. <laughs> like, a lot of people right. are like nothing, but what right. do you need is a very different question. Right. And we also know, you know, with like the love languages and all that, I mean, mm. it might, you know, it might be, I just need to be held. Yeah. I just need to cry right yeah. now. I just need to yell. Yeah. Um, I just need you to just like leave me alone. Yeah. I just need you to go make me a milkshake. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, you know, we have to make it safe for each other mm. to, um, to screw up also. And, uh, you know, yet yesterday, the other day, I, you know, right, right around all this, you know, police brutality stuff there, I, I posted like as, you know, as a man, you know, a man of white privilege. And it's like, I don't even know what to say to start the conversation about the fact that I don't know what to say. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, and I got more comments and more response than probably any other silly post that I've made, you know, where wow. I pretend to know the answer. Right. So I, I think that, you know, I, I think that it, it takes vulnerability and courage to just say, I don't know. Mm. Um, and you know, and we do our homework and we try to find out what we can, but I think now is really a time for listening mm. and deepening our listening and not only listening to the words, but listening to the energy, listening to what, um, practicing, listening for the feeling, um, you know, as emotional intelligence experts, you know, we encourage people to expand their vocabulary in terms of what, uh, 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 what emotions are available to us i know certainly in the work that i do with men you know we know three we know pissed off um we know pissed off stressed and angry mm. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, but, but that sums uh, it know, all think, up though right <laughs> you know, i think Brene brown public you know had like a list of like at least a thousand emotions or something like that so wow. just beginning to label our emotions um we start with ourselves throughout the day it's just really trying to understand what's the emotion maybe underneath the emotion that um, that is the most real. I mean, there could be several emotions mm. that are kind of all kind of coalescing, but the, the more, the more we become, um, the, the, the more we can broaden our emotional vocabulary, 
the, the more we'll be able to demonstrate empathy toward others, right? You, you don't always have to get it right, but it, you know, but the, the, the sentence, the frame would be like, it sounds like you're frustrated because you had so many plans and now right. they're, um, they've been changed. Right. Or it, it sounds like you're, you're feeling guilty because you wanted to do, you wanted to show up this way, but you're, mm. you've shown up that way. Right. And the worst thing is somebody will say, well, no, that's not it. Actually, it's actually I'm pissed off or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, but even just taking the, but that it, mindful but moment to acknowledge it. Right. It sounds like X because Y, mm. right? And just and making it okay for people to feel whatever they're feeling. You know, um, I that that's actually great advice, and I think that's something that I need to implement a little bit more because I noticed that, especially through this pandemic, I noticed myself saying, "I am so annoyed," and then <laughs> I'm like, "But why am I really annoyed?" Right? Like little things are annoying me, but it, I'm not. Is it like okay? It's something deeper than that, like various yeah. things are causing these annoyances, but what is actually the feeling that I'm feeling behind that? Because it's very right. easy it's, to say, I'm annoyed. Well, and that's the, and that's the mindfulness exercise, mm -hmm. right? You know, for me, it's journaling. That's where I yeah. realize sometimes like what's really underneath because my hands become sort of a channel for yes. my heart and, Mine too. You know, yeah. and I see what's, what's happening. But, um, you know, the, we, we tend to, like the top, the, uh, the emotions that, that are on the surface, I mean, they're real too, but like when you peel back the onion, often there's like a, there's something else that's, that's much more the core energy of, mm. of what you're, you're feeling. I know like for men, um, this is a huge one for men, uh, is shame. Mm. And, um, and that's not a word that a lot of men would be able to um that's not a feeling that men might would readily be able to identify but it's often what is underneath the fear the anger or the, or the expression of anger interesting um you know shame shame that they're not you know that they made a mistake that they don't have all the answers that they're not where they want to be mm -hmm. in their lives um you know shame that they're not providing as well as they could for their you know, for their families, um, mm. you know, all of that. So that's the work that I do with mainly with men, um, with, with men, coaches, consultants, executives, leaders. Um, I work with men and women and teams, but um, lately I'm really called to help men become more, um, more aware of, of their emotions so that they can use those emotions in a, in a, an appropriate way. Mm. Um, and have greater success in their, in their businesses and their lives. Oh, I love that. That's so powerful as well. And I didn't, I didn't think I would even think that shame would be that underlying emotion, but it makes sense too. Um, I know for me, a lot that comes up when I'm like working with women is, is like their, their worthiness. Like I'm not yeah. worth it. Is that yeah. something that you find a lot with women as well? Sure, absolutely, and and you know that's the I'm not good enough, the, right? The sabotage, the uh, the uh, you know th there's there's so often a message of I'm not good enough that the you know when you peel back a lot of these other messages that that people are telling themselves, it's it's rather insidious mm. that that sabotage. I'm not worthy because I'm not enough. Yeah, um, it's yeah. like a a cycle, <laughs> like yeah. breaking yeah. it down. Yeah, I, I even had to do an entire, one of my mentors gave me an exercise of, uh, I was going over my beliefs about men within relationships. And uh, she's like, we were doing my positive beliefs and negative beliefs. And my negative beliefs list wasn't even that long. I think I actually have an episode coming out about this soon. So um, my negative beliefs list was not that long, but I didn't realize how deep they were and how much that I tied how other people treated me to how I saw myself and how I affected my worth. And I was like, you know, I, I think one of my beliefs was I believe a man will leave or cheat on me when I am no longer pretty enough, smart enough. And she's uh, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like that's ooh. a lot. Like those yeah. are a lot of different characteristics and you have to work on each of those individually sure. because you can't just package it all as one. Yeah. even then. And, and it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean the, the, um, you know, often the, one of the first questions I'll ask men that I work with is, 
you know, you know what what were the beliefs that that you had or were um, around the expression of emotion? Ooh. You know, what what were the conversations around emotion that you had when you were growing up? Mm. And um, so because often those and then the follow up question is, how is that belief working for you right now or against you? Oh, that's um, powerful. So sometimes people have let go of that belief and they've changed, they've created a new one. But some people are still going off of, you know, their dad telling them, you know, to stop being a baby and to man up. Or, right. Boys um, don't cry. Boys yeah. don't cry, right. So clearly this boy does. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but I do still feel, I, I wouldn't, shame would be a, um, a strong word, but I do sometimes feel, you know, I'm uncomfortable with that level of vulnerability. Right. Um, you know, but uh, I've cried a bunch of times today, as I said, but I didn't, but I haven't felt the need to apologize for it. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, I just feel like it's, you know, we're talking about connection, right? So yeah. connection is vulnerability is such a key aspect of that mm. and being able to show your heart and, uh, allow yourself to, um, uh, to let other people in. Yeah. That's, that's how we create. Yeah. And, te- and, and tears are an energy release too. Like yeah. uh, I yeah. think a lot of people don't realize of like, sometimes you get like that good cry out and then you just realize that uh, you feel a little bit lighter almost. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. all right, I can move That's on. why I watch a lot of Lifetime movies. Oh, me too. <laughs> I always know how they're going to end. <laughs> you're like, all always. right, I, I've seen this one before and you've played that same doesn't part. Matter. <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I can actually, so now we'll watch them and I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll recite what the actor is about to say. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like 90% right most of the time. You, you <laughs> ghost wrote them and no one even knows about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm not giving up my baby. It's like I yeah. knew she was gonna say. Yeah, we already we've already we knew the plot line before we even hit, but I still want to see how it how it all comes Absolutely. out. Doesn't yeah. make it less fun, you know. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, one more thing I really want to touch yeah. on was just businesses right now are man, it's it's just a whole different ball game for them. And I've been seeing and hearing a lot from the entrepreneur community, particularly those with small businesses, that this pandemic has really just rocked them. It's creating new challenges to navigate and it's pushing them into a new era of how to do business. So as a coach, are there any new things that you're seeing related to this pandemic? Yeah. Well, I mean, some people are having a much easier time with it than others. And, you know, depending on what the business is, some people have been online are very comfortable with that or you know they're working in the online retail space and you know it hasn't been as impacted as much as some who are working in bricks and mortar um and most of my clients that you know they're um they haven't been profoundly impacted mm-hmm. um it's more the anxiety and the uncertainty of what may be coming yes um so they're you know they're often and it's understandable people are are maybe afraid of of making big financial investments um, in their business in terms of infrastructure, in terms of marketing expense or whatever, when they really just don't know what the, what the environment's going to be over the next few months. Mm-hmm. But, but I would say that, you know, this is the advice that I give pretty much to all of my business owner clients, as well as executives, because, you know, they've got branding issues as well. As well. They, yep. <laughs> they've got brands, you know, they've got their personal brand and they've got their organization's brand. But, you know, th- this is a moment, well, first of all, to sort of step into your leadership, decide what kind of leader you want to be, mm-hmm. um, and and to just to also increase your visibility and, and your servant leadership and your responsiveness um, to, to be em- emotionally plugged in, to not be tone deaf to what's going on, but to, but to stay visible because... Mm-hmm. You know, when we bounce back, people will remember the people, uh, you know, the people who stayed visible, who didn't hide, right. who didn't get small, um, you know, who didn't, who were putting out positive vibes and, you know, not, not Pollyanna, but, you know, right. who were sort of staying in the, staying in the game. Um, people have, you know, pe- uh, people will remember that. And I think if you're a leader, I think also it's a, and you're running teams, I, you know, just double down on your empathy because, mm. Um, you know, it, there will be a time to, to remind people that there's a job to do and they need to, you know, it's head down and, and, you know, just get shit done. But right. I also think that it's always been the case more so now 
than ever. It's that people leave jobs because of their relationship with their boss and that the boss doesn't seem to care. Um, you know, when the, when the economy springs back, they'll be out the door, you know, because you haven't instilled any loyalty. Mm. Um, but, but, but my clients who are most, being most successful right now, they're being opportunistic without being sleazy. Um, you know, they're looking at their messaging. They're looking at how they can be responsive. They're looking at what the market is telling them is needed and responding, you know, which also may mean having, um, you know, sliding scale in terms of, uh, in terms of fees, in terms of services and, and and all of that. But, you know, but I tell my clients, you know, (laughs) go big or go home. And since most of us are home anyway, (laughs) you might as well go go big. I love it. I love it. All it such... also requires resilience, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm launching a bunch of programs right now, which aren't frankly filling as quickly as I think they should. Mm. Um, you know, but but back to what we were saying earlier, I'm I'm purpose led. I you know, so I'm not going to give up. I and the, the the ultimate expression of what that group looks like may change based on market realities, but it doesn't make me any less. It doesn't make me any less committed to um, to be that purposeful in what I create. Oh, I love it. And you know, I actually think that there's just going to be this new shift of like thought leaders. So like, I feel like, you know, we used to have all these emphasis on celebrities and I, I really think there's going to be this shift into people who are promoting positivity and using their voice to do something yeah. and to, to shift the world. So. Um, I think if- you're right. I think there's a, I think that there's been sort of a leveling um, mm. I know as a professional speaker, I'm seeing that, you know, it's like, it's, I think there are going to be more opportunities for, for speakers because a lot of the really big, 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 big speakers where, whose entire businesses were built on having big companies yeah. around speaking, you know, they're, they're struggling where the more scrappy speakers with a message, smaller, mm-hmm. um, smaller, but no less powerful, mighty, I think yeah. are, mighty are going to have a lot of opportunity because you know, people connect to people who are real and sort of in the trenches with them. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. Where can our audience go to learn more about you and your work and to connect with you further? Sure. So my website is alansamuelcohen.com. A whole bunch of cool stuff there, um, including my TED Talk, um, which is right on the homepage, The Magical Power of Shared Purpose. And then for anyone who wants, uh, I've created an infographic. It's tips for leading yourself and others through uncertainty. And that link is um, bit.ly slash ASC leadership. Beautiful. I'll make sure I I make sure I link. I I think I have it in my notes. So I'll I'll be sure to link it either way. (laughs) I think that's right. Happy to hear from anyone, provide support or resources or however I can help. Oh, Alan, you are transforming people's lives in a big way and you are making a huge impact in our world. Thank you so much for being a world shifter and sharing your light and wisdom with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Alan is brilliant and inspiring. I enjoy connecting with him and I know you will too. I've linked Alan's social channels, website, book, and all the other resources on this week's episode notes found on mindbizlife.com. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend. Sharing helps get the information and this podcast into the homes, cars, and earbuds of many. I'm back on Friday for a new episode of Food Your Life Friday, but until then, remember, every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.